seems like it's been a really fun and active few days. It's really great to see this happening over here. It's a fantastic idea that that just with that. So um, um, I'm going to talk today, and also to the speakers today, um, we're all very related, I think, to the, to the kind of work that we do between our own little network. Um, but I'm hoping to bring a couple of new subjects to this area of uh, information flow today, and I mean literally subjects, people, because I think um, information doesn't always flow that easily. Um, and so I think what I'm going to show today are, in some ways, they might be a little more old-fashioned, <laughs> but in some, and also they're static. And um, the reason that the data sets that I use are static will become really self-evident as I describe what I'm doing. So I'm going to start with a, a more abstract um, project because it, it sort of um, it brought a certain context of work that I was doing to an end, and it also opened up a whole new field of, of research that I've been doing. And the other thing that you'll find in the work that I do is the client is sort of absent, um, and I like that, and I continue to do that, and I hope I will be able to continue that for a long time. So this is a project that ended up um, being shown at the Whitney Altria, that's an obvious reference to Ellsworth Kelly. Um, and these are four monochrome landscapes in the world. Um, the rule was that the image had to be photographed by a high-resolution satellite. And I know everybody's been talking about Google Earth today, and I haven't heard the word high-resolution satellite imagery once. Um, that's because I'm probably a little older, and I know the, um, the vagaries of the Google Earth database. Um, it's actually not, um, it's not high-resolution of the whole world. If you zoom in on certain parts, you still can't get the facts. You still can't get enough information, and in fact, at a certain scale, you can never get enough information. So um, the rule of these images was monochrome landscapes, which actually is very difficult with a satellite image to find monochrome landscapes, because in fact, um, you'll find that most monochromes are of endangered environments or ones that are fast disappearing. So white is Anwar in Alaska. Um, blue happens to be the zero, zero point on Earth, which is above the Atlantic Ocean. Um, yellow is the, um, the desert of Iraq on one of the first days of the most recent wars. And green is the rainforest in Cameroon. Um, so these are, this is the full image as purchased. Um, in the old days, and you still actually have to purchase satellite images. They're very expensive. Each of these costs $2,000. Um, and when you zoom in, you do get um, a certain amount of, of detail. Um, each of these images have a story, and I'm not going to tell you the story of every one of these, but just this one, which happened to open up um, a whole another set of research for me. Um, it was a collaboration with an NGO called Global Forest Watch. And their job is to monitor the rainforests of the world. And the way they do that is with a network of satellites um, very high up in the ground, up in the sky, and with networks hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, community organizations on the ground to help them with their research. So they were um, looking for an illegal road through one of the rainforests, a logging road through one of the rainforests in Cameroon. And all they had were these nine set images. Nine set images are free. Um, you can, you can, you know, they update it every three days of every single spot in the world, as opposed to high resolution satellite images, which have to be tasked. So you have to actually tell a satellite where to go, a person has to do that, and so the, the quality of the database very much depends on who has purchased images. Um, and so the first time that high resolution satellite imagery was used this way um, as investigative journalism was in the New York Times in 1999, just as the satellite actually became commercialized and available to the, to the um, civilian public like you and me to buy images. This was the first time that the New York Times used the satellite as an investigative journalist because it was too dangerous to send people to Brosny in the year 1999. Um, satellite imagery and the technology of satellite has its vagaries and cannot see through the clouds. And so I actually waited a long time 
to purchase this image. Um, and when I eventually got it, um, it did turn out that it was an illegal road. Um, and the NGO used the, the image to fight a law case in Milwaukee. Okay, so this next project takes um, a little more time, a little more explanation um, to, to go through. Um, and this is the first project of the Spatial Information Design Lab, and it's a collaboration between myself as an architect, um, Eric Pedora, who's a criminal justice activist, um, and David Reinford, a graphic designer, and Sarah Williams, who is also in the lab with me. Um, the, the, the research had already begun, but um, we happened to win a competition with this, with this material at the Architectural League. They put out a proposal for architecture and something which pushed the boundaries and definition of what architecture might be in the future. Um, so the show was this big table, the mass on the wall, these photographs, which these uh, uh, pamphlets which we distributed, and it's also actually online as well. Um, so the premise behind the project, um, architects love to talk about infrastructure, and in this country, um, in this American Heritage Dictionary, this is the way the word is um, defined. Um, you can read it yourselves, but the, the, the surprising word over here is prisons, that prisons are um, the infrastructure of our, our cities in the United States. And this is no big surprise because prison populations have risen from 200,000 in the year 1970 to upwards of 2 million in the year 2000. Um, the, the rise in prison populations is not directly related to the rise in the rise and fall in crime. So when you see peaks in the in the crime rate in the in the crime rate, you still see the straight rise in prison populations, and it's keeping going. Um, as opposed to public housing in this country, um, uh, it, which occupies 3 million people, it's kind of a staggering statistic that 3 million and 2 million are so closely aligned. Um, so at the basis of our project is that, you know, the city is very common language here today to everybody, a network of networks, um, and a very unstable interaction between all of these uh, forces and networks and built. Uh, environments. So the information that also we heard today is about these elements is constantly um, exchanged between the networks and also translated into data. So data as individuals, although it can be uh, tracked with uh, what we call the easy pass and your credit card and you know all of that. Um, there's actually some data that's very difficult to get. And this data set that we worked with, we would not have gotten access to if it were not for Eric Dora and his incredibly activist project that he's taken on for the last 20 years. But this is a database of um, people who have been sentenced to prison by New York City courts. This is not a publicly accessible database and I cannot uh, give it away. Um, and when you look at this data, um, in a geographic context, what we do is we take each point um, that, of that person who's been incarcerated, and instead of looking at their crime, um, we look at the home address of where they say they've been living. When you do that, and you uh, average the data to these census blocks, and then give it a scale, what you find um, is that people who are incarcerated are highly concentrated in neighborhoods while crime is very dispersed um, across the city. So this is um, the density map of prison admissions. Well, this is a density map of non-violent crime. So just to reiterate that point. Um, so from our point of view, um, crime geographies lead to crime prevention tactics, like sending the police out onto the streets and spending more public dollars. While prison geographies lead to what might be called um, community resettlement projects. So when you look at it that way, um, you have to confront the fact that prison geographies intersect with geographies of poverty, of poverty and with neighborhoods of color. So this is a, a map, this is all Brooklyn by the way, I'm using Brooklyn as a case study because you don't know the shape of Brooklyn. Um, so this is uh, the percent of people of color in Brooklyn, you notice 